More than a privilege, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight. I've had the privilege of experiencing working with Dr. Susan George, seeing her learning and teaching. I came to St. Vincent Hospital and visited Worcester for the first time in January 2000. Dr. Susan George was conducting morning report at 7.30 in the morning, you residents. <laughs> I thought it was a wonderful uh, session, one hour learning from a case where Dr. Susan, Dr. Andal Sadagopan presented a wonderful session of teaching and learning that was followed up by noon conference by Dr. Les Lab Laszlo. What a wonderful experience. No wonder I'm still here in Worcester. Well, uh, for completeness and the traditions say that we have to tell the great achievements of our speaker. They will go on and on. So I'll be brief. If you want to go through her CV, that itself is a learning experience. <laughs> Dr. Susan George uh, is presently program director of, Saint Vin at, of the medicine uh, residency program at St. Vincent's. She's a professor of medicine at the UMass Medical School. She's an MRCP Edinburgh. She's an MACP, which is Masters of the ACP. She has awards as a student learning. When she was a resident, she was awarded oral presentation at the ACP, poster presentation at the ACP, medical jeopardy champion at the ACP. So that was her learning period. Then as a teacher, Best Teacher Award, Physician of the Year Award, Top 10 Hospitalists Award by the ACP, and the list goes on and on. She has been a preceptor for medical students, pharmacy students, residents. She's a member of 1,000 committees at St. Vincent Hospital. <laughs> Please welcome our distinguished colleague and my dear friend, Dr. Susan George. All right, good evening. I was going to start with a joke. How many doctors does it take to fix a mic? But, you know, we'll skip that. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. I am so grateful that you have stayed on. And, you know, I think there's a Celtics game tonight. But thank you for being here. And my sincere thanks to Dr. Repose for his generously kind words and to the Worcester District Medical Society nominating committee for this honor. I also, at the outset, want to thank all of my teachers present in the room and those who have not been able to join me. And uh, you know they've guided me on my journey of learning. Dr. Popkin, Dr. Lockery, Dr. Carlin, Dr. Bassett, Dr. Esposito sent his regards. I also want to thank all my friends and colleagues whose support I depend on every day. And all my students and trainees who continue to inspire me. I have no disclosures, but I must say it hit me hard as to how ancient I am when I calculated that I've been learning medicine for about 40 years now and teaching for about the same duration. I entered medical school at the age of 18 at the National University of Singapore, went on to do my advanced training from the Royal College of Edinburgh, UK, and I was able to briefly witness the practice of medicine for about one and a half years in North India. And then I started my residency training here in the US in 1997. I'm grateful for the opportunity to share what I've learned over the years, having worked and trained in three different continents. I'm not a pundit of history or education like many in this room. And I look forward to all of your insight at the end of this talk. I hope to take you on this journey of discovery and introspection with me. The experience may feel more like a narration rather than an oration, as there are many stories I'd like to share. Over the course of the next 45 minutes, and I'll try and speak fast so that we get you out on time, I wish to review how learning and teaching in the field of medicine have evolved over the centuries. 
We will then touch on more recent changes that have impacted medical education and end off with the future of what our field will look like. It was Maya Angelou who said, if you don't know where you've come from, you don't know where you're going. As we journey through the centuries, we will see the origin of many of our current practices and perhaps notice that we may be repeating some past mistakes. I will point out some interesting associations as we travel, travel through time. So buckle up as we dial back the time machine and go back to the future. A commonality amongst the most ancient civilizations was that the practice of medicine and healing were deeply steeped in religion and mysticism and based purely on empiric observation. The transmission of knowledge from teacher to student was mostly an oral and entirely through apprenticeship for practical experiences. As the body of knowledge accumulated, written texts were developed. Let's start with ancient Mesopotamia. It is believed that Gula, the Sumerian goddess of healing, guided doctors and dentists in the treatment of health problems, which were usually attributed to supernatural causes. Physicians in Mesopotamia were believed to be agents through which the deities worked and were highly educated and respected. They had to learn the cuneiform script and master the curriculum of scribal book for about 12 years before they could devote to the study of medicine. Illness was attributed to sin and therefore healing started with confession. Medical training was in the temple because physicians were priests. In early Sumeria, there were as many female physicians as male, but this unfortunately changed with time as rulers changed. We move next to ancient Egypt. Imhotep, that's him, I'm not sure if you can see him. He was an ancient uh, Egyptian high priest and polymath. A polymath is an expert in many fields. He was also the first physician in recorded history. He was a brilliant architect who designed the pyramids as well as an engineer, so this man could do everything. He was revered as a philosopher and attained divine status after his death. In fact, Imhotep was deified by the Greeks as Asclepius, the god of healing. Medical treatment in ancient Egypt included dressings, procedures such as suturing and incision and drainage, as well as anatomic observations which were passed through apprenticeship again. Physicians in training were priests of the per ankh or the house of life, and studied in libraries which were attached to temples. The earliest reliable information about medicine in ancient India and medical practitioners known as Vaidyas is available beginning 1500 before Common Era. During the pre-Vedic period, bodily ailments were attributed to divine uh, factors, and the role of priests was to establish contact between God and humans, and they used their power for healing purposes. The priest was therefore also the healer and worked through prayers, plants, and ointments. In the later Vedic era, disease was felt to be due to derangement of phlegm, wind, and bile due to seasonal changes, infections with germs and worms, and contaminated food. So there we have the beginnings of infectious disease and epidemiology. Now notable in history were Shushruta, that's him on the right. He was the first surgeon and he may have been the first physician to perform cataract surgery. And Charaka on the left, who worked in the king's court and was the father of Ayurvedic medicine. Ayurveda integrates the balance of body, mind and spirit to promote wellness and treat health problems. Their teachings were scribed and texts handed down. Vaidyas or physicians underwent medical training in ashramas or religious retreats. They belonged to different castes and classes since they believed it was training, not birth, that makes a Vaidya or physician. 
I loved the enlightenment on equity, except that <coughs> women were usually not admitted to medical training at that time. The admission process was stringent. A medical student was expected to be honest, humble, temperate, generous, and hardworking. Medical training was over seven years. The medical student was admitted by a proper ceremony, just like our white coat ceremony. He was expected to follow a strict code of conduct and behavior. No womanizing or gambling was allowed. Rote learning was an integral part of medical education, and students were expected to memorize the entire classical text and their commentaries. Practical training was also an important part of Ayurvedic studies where they observed their teachers curing the ill and assisted in the preparation of medication. As part of their surgical training, Shushruta advised Ayurvedic students to practice surgical procedures on vegetables, fruits, and body parts of animals. So this is the predecessor of our simulation training. For anatomic knowledge, Shushruta recommended careful observation of the dead body. Dissection was not allowed as the body was considered sacred. Charaka suggested learning how to identify herbs. Now, Avaidya was supposed to involve himself in the exclusive study of philosophical topics, participate in debates, and become proficient in the art of public speaking. The Vedic test, text also advised the doctor-patient relationship. Charaka says, the goal of the Vaidya was not for self, not for fulfillment of any earthly desire or gain, but solely for the good of suffering should you treat your patients. There were many checks for Vaidyas. License from the state was a prerequisite for taking up medical practice, even at that time. Fines were imposed for incorrect treatment of patients. So again, we see the predecessor of the Board of Medicine and Licensure. <laughs> Traditional Chinese medicine worked on the premise that imbalance caused disease. There was a lot of emphasis on individualized treatment. To see a person who is sick, not the disease the person has, as well as the emphasis on preventive medicine. Education was based on the master apprentice model and the first textbook was scribed based on discussion between teacher and students. Traditional Chinese medicine emphasized the principles of preserving good health through proper nutrition and harmony between human spirit and environment. A good doctor treats the disease, a superior doctor prevents it. Thank you. This is another plug for preventive medicine and the under-recognized work that primary care physicians do. Way to go, all right? That's good. Now, there were two famous physicians, Dr. Chang, who mastered and taught pattern recognition and differential diagnosis. He also introduced pulse diagnosis. The other was Dr. Hua Tuo, who was known to be the first physician using a mixture of herbs to create anesthesia as well as utilizing heat and alcohol for sterilization of his instruments. Now, due to Chinese philosophy of keeping the body intact, surgery and dissecting was not popular. Hence, there was not much development in this field. Hippocrates. He is regarded as the father of rational medicine in Greece. Hippocrates believed that a body became ill when there was an imbalance in the four senses of humor, which were blood, black bile, yellow bile, and phlegm. Medicine therefore aimed to restore the balance. He usually did not use drugs, except if they were natural balms and extracts. He gave emphasis to the sterilization and use of clean water and wine to heal wounds. The Hippocratic School taught physicians to be strictly professional and to follow certain procedures. They had to be calm, honest, understanding, and smart. The most important innovation of the Hippocratic School 
was that he made physicians keep detailed records of all observations and treatment for every case because he believed that these records would be very helpful for later generations. In this way, Hippocrates founded clinical medicine. After many observations, he came to believe that diseases could be a matter of family inheritance, natural environment, lifestyle, and wait for this, food habits. I love it. And so this was the start of lifestyle and preventive medicine again. The division between medicine as a science and medicine as an art is an ancient one. Plato believed the art and science of medicine was identical and that you had to see your patient as a whole, body and soul. According to Plato, there were two types of medical apprenticeships, one that was based only on observation and experience versus a theoretically grounded physician philosopher who worked to make the understanding of nature fundamental to their art and teaching. The majority of medical practitioners at that time did not pursue biological theories and philosophy. However, the few that did care about the nature of health and underlying anatomic and physiologic changes behind any particular disease were considered the leaders of their profession. The passing on of knowledge through mentoring was highly regarded in ancient Greece from as early as Homer's time. Accordingly, Medical knowledge was bequeathed usually from father to son or to the physician's assistant via a master-apprentice relationship. The apprentice learned by observing and assisting the master curing patients. Such medical education was fundamentally practical. The student learned to take detailed medical history from the patient, catalog observations, and accordingly formulate hypotheses, explanations, and treatments. He was trained to properly use his senses of observation from hearing, smelling, palpating, and carefully examining the patient's pains, mental state, position in bed, fever, breathing, and excretions, which included urine, feces, and sweats. There were also tenets in the study of medicine, justice for patients, secrecy of patient information, that's the beginning of our HIPAA, respect for teachers and solidarity with peers. The master apprentice model was gradually replaced by that of professor student. Now due to the notable change in the character of medical education, larger numbers of students were tutored by fewer professors. The introduction of a new direction of medical education where some students studied biology and medicine, not for the purpose of professional practice, but as part of scientific and philosophic exploration, started causing a division where studies depended on each student's social status, while the more healthy protégés were generally preferring to focus on academic approach to medicine. The tripartite division of medicine, medical education can be seen from as early as Aristotle's time when he described the physician who is a craftsman, the scientific physician, or the man who has studied medicine as part of his education. Now, early Arabic medicine was built on legacies left behind by the Greeks and Romans and was strongly influenced by Galen and Hippocrates. Most medical literature from Greece came from Greece and Rome and were translated into Arabic and later adapted to include their own findings and conclusions. The major contribution was the development of pharmacy. The Renaissance period in Europe saw a revival of learning. Universities established schools where experiments were conducted, observations were recorded, and conclusions shared which led to the questioning of knowledge from Greece and Rome. The Renaissance period artists, such as Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci, revolutionized painting and the understanding and appreciation of the human body. This led to improved knowledge of anatomy. It was in the late 13th and early 14th century that some European countries began to legalize dissection 
of executed criminals for educational purposes. Prior to this, the human body was considered sacred and a dissection considered desecration. So with these dissections, the explosion of knowledge along with the invention of the printing press by Gutenberg allowed new ideas to spread very quickly across Europe. It was during this period that we had greats like Vesalius, William Harvey, and Edward Jenner. In 1800, medical practice and education were mostly based on symptoms and their empiric treatment. The difference between the educated and uneducated physician was actually knowledge outside of medicine, such as art, music, and history, because neither group possessed any major knowledge of medicine. Lennox's introduction of the stethoscope revolutionized medicine with the emphasis on physical examination and correlation with anatomy. Now from Germany around this time came the integration of lab data. So during this period, learning was very hands-on and students in medicine worked rather than listened and were educated rather than instructed. In Europe, during the 18th and 19th centuries, small groups of physicians came together to create proprietary medical schools, offering lectures and collecting fees from students. For the professors, these fees helped supplement their incomes from their private practice. In addition, a young man, because no women were allowed, seeking a career in medicine could serve as an apprentice, working with an established physician until he was regarded as sufficiently competent to set up his own practice. At the best medical schools in London, Edinburgh, and Paris, students could also experience practical bedside teaching in hospitals. Curriculum had therefore become more standardized with a mix of classroom lectures, lab work, and bedside learning. Before the American Revolution, Practitioners were trained chiefly by apprenticeship, and a few who could afford the time and expense usually traveled abroad, mostly to England, Scotland, France, and Germany for their medical education. In 1765, John Morgan and William Shippen of Philadelphia, both graduates of the University of Edinburgh, founded the first medical school in America, now part of the University of Pennsylvania. I will not have time to go into the tale of betrayal between these two men. That's, you know, uh, enjoyable reading. Students were admitted to anatomic lectures and a course on the theory and practice of physic at the College of Philadelphia. Additional medical schools were founded, and these were at King's College, which is now Columbia University in 1768 and Harvard in 1783. The Medical College of Philadelphia offered two degrees, the Bachelor of Medicine and Doctor of Medicine. For a Bachelor of Medicine degree, students had to take a course of lectures in anatomy, materia medica, chemistry, theory, practice of physics, as well as attend clinical lectures, attend the practice of the Pennsylvania Hospital for a whole year, serve an apprenticeship for some reputable practitioner in physics, show his knowledge in Latin and mathematics, and then pass a public exam. For doctorate degree, the student had to be at least 24 years old and already acquired a bachelor's degree in medicine at least three years earlier, and then write and publicly defend a thesis to be published at his own expense. In 1893, John Sopkins Medical School was started as part of the university and closely integrated with the Johns Hopkins Hospital. In addition to upgrading undergraduate medical education with an increased emphasis on research, the Hopkins School originated uh, the residency training system. Johns Hopkins was a Baltimore merchant and banker who funded the school, and Dr. William Welch, the dean, brought on Dr. William Osler the first chief of medicine at Johns Hopkins. Now, Sir Osler at that time warned that the ideals of medicine would change 
as teacher and student chased each other down the fascinating road of research, forgetful of those wider interests to which a hospital must minister. I want to take a minute to tell you a little bit about Sir William Osler, who is uh, described as the father of modern medicine. He was the eighth of nine children, the son of a priest. He had enrolled in Trinity College for divinity studies to follow in his father's footsteps, but later switched to medicine at McGill after just one year of um, divinity studies. He then went on to Europe uh, to further his medical studies, and he initially planned to train in ophthalmology. But thankfully for humanity, he was uh, actually rejected, and he switched to general medicine. So we have him because he didn't make it into ophthalmology. His journey took him to the University of Pennsylvania and subsequently to Johns Hopkins as chief of medicine. Osler helped introduce a new emphasis on bedside in clinical instruction. His best known saying was, listen to your patient. He's telling you the diagnosis. He started a system of organized postgraduate training and education that is still the standard for the Western world. Around this time, we had our first black physicians. James McCune Smith was born a slave. And even though he was at the top of his class, he was denied admission to medical school in the US, but he was accepted at the University of Glasgow. Dr. Smith graduated with an MD degree in 1837. Dr. Peck was the first black person to earn a medical degree from an American medical school, which was Rush Medical College in 1847. Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell's greatest wish was to be accepted into a Philadelphia medical school, but she was turned away because she was a woman. She applied to 12 country schools before she was finally accepted to Geneva Medical College, New York. She continued her training in Europe before she returned here to the US to practice. And many more women followed her in the years after. In 2019, in that graph, uh, which is in the left corner, women comprised 50.5% 50, 50 of first year medical students when for the first time, we became the majority. In 1892, Dr. Andrew Taylor still opened the first osteopathic medical school to train its pioneer class of 21 students, which included six women. He believed in the concept of wellness rather than disease and treating illness within the context of the whole body. A groundbreaking book, ground book written by Dr. Barber uh, explains and shows the growth of medicine in the US. It is interesting to note that they face many of the same challenges that currently exist and that we continue to fight for. The bloody civil war created an urgent national demand for more medical personnel and hospitals. In the 19th century, things became complicated when groups of physicians throughout the country began founding small proprietary medical colleges. They divided amongst themselves the lectures and the spoils of student fees. Entrance and graduation requirements were sufficiently low to ensure a steady income for professors. Lab and clinical facilities were very inadequate and large numbers of poorly trained physicians were released to practice on the public. Doctors were seen more as tradesmen rather than as professionals. In 1850, there were 52 medical schools in the United States as opposed to just three in France. This, however, did not indicate superiority in the quality of American medical education. American medical schools of the early and mid 19th century were generally doctor owned institutions that varied widely in their standards and methods of education. As a result, the abler and more ambitious students continued going to Europe to pursue medical training. 
Early in the 19th century, Paris hospitals were the major attraction, and after the Civil War, Americans flocked to Austrian and German universities, uh, some to learn a clinical specialty and others the basic sciences. Dr. Nathan Davis believed that medicine so crucial to society must rise above the inconsistencies and become a standardized, respected profession. He went on to found the American Medical Association in 1847. It is sad though to note that there was bigotry even amongst some pillars in medicine. Dr. Davis stopped or worked to stop the admission of black physicians to the AMA and in fact, it took another 100 years to change that. Harvard was the first major school to adopt reform. In 1870, Harvard president, Dr. Charles Eliot said, the ignorance and general incompetency of the average graduate of American medical schools at the time when he receives his degree, which turns him loose upon the community, is something horrible to contemplate. The whole system of medical education in this country needs thorough reformation. Harvard introduced a graded curriculum into medical school. They lengthened the course from two to three years and elevated entrance requirements. They also instituted part-time salaries paid by the university to professors rather than the dependence on direct payment from student fees. This allowed professors protected time to teach. This is a practice we must continue to safeguard so that faculty can dedicate time to teaching and mentoring without worrying about how to pay their bills. Focus shifted to laboratory work rather than lectures. The curriculum was refined to focus on practical sciences of histology, pathology, and chemistry. This transformed Harvard from a regional institution to a world-class university. Now, Dr. Abraham Flexner, under the auspices of the AMA Council on Medical Education and the Carnegie Foundation, reported his survey on medical education in the United States and Canada in 1910, and they had immediate and far-reaching impact. If you will please allow me to just take a minute to share with you the introduction of the Flexner Report. It is so eloquently written, it gives you an idea of what training was like then. So pay attention. The American Medical School is now well along in the second century of its history. It began and for many years continued to exist as a supplement to the apprenticeship still in vogue during the 17th and 18th centuries. The likely youth of that period destined to a medical career was at an early age indentured to some reputable practitioner to whom his service was successively menial, pharmaceutical, and professional. He ran his master's errands, washed the bottles, mixed the drugs, spread the plaster, and finally, as the stipulated term drew to its close, actually took part in the daily practice of his preceptor bleeding his patients, pulling their teeth, and obeying the hurried summons in the middle of the night. Sounds like night float, okay? Okay. The quality of the training varied within large limits with the capacity and consciousness of the master. Ambitious spirits, therefore, sought a more assured and inspiring discipline. Beginning early in the 18th century, having served their time at home, they resorted in rapidly increasing numbers to the hospitals and lecture halls of Leiden, I had to look this up, this was in Netherlands, Paris, London, and Edinburgh. The difficulty of the undertaking proved admirably selective, for the students who crossed the Atlantic gave a good account of themselves. Returning to their native land, they sought opportunities to share with their less fortunate or less adventurous fellows the rich experience gained as they walked the hospitals of the old world in the footsteps of Cullen, Monroe, and the Hunters. The voices of the great masters of that day thus re-echoed in the recent Western wilderness. High scientific and professional ideals impelled the youthful enthusiasts who bore their lighted torches safely back across the waters." Unquote. 
Now, Flexner's findings and recommendations were as follows. One, there was an overproduction of undertrained practitioners with a fatal difference between the best, the average, and the worst. Two, there were too many commercial schools. Three, the country needs fewer and better doctors. And the way to get them better is to produce fewer. The report commended a ratio of one physician to 760 uh, patients and one more physician for every gain of 1,500 in the total population. There were about 131 medical schools in the United States, and most of them were proprietary. By 1920, 46 had closed and were absorbed by stronger institutions. Others were strengthened by merger, by university affiliation, and by the infusion of support from private foundations and state governments. By the 1920s, the four years of medical school were now compartmentalized, two years of basic sciences and two years of clinical training. Now, there were several criticisms of Flexner's, Flexner's 1910 report. Who, they had recommended all a closing of all but two historically black medical colleges, despite acknowledging that two colleges could not train enough physicians to serve 9.8 million black people in the U.S. at that time. The question also arises whether they got their math wrong and if that explains some of the current shortages of doctors. Over the 20th century, several of the agencies that have become very familiar to us came into existence. The NRMP, to the ECFMG in 1954, to the ACGME in 1981. Now, they were all introduced to ensure quality of trainees and regularity of process of admission. The purpose of ACGME was to enhance program structure and maintain balance between service and education as well as increasing the quality and amount of formal education. Resident evaluation and feedback was also given greater emphasis. In 2002, ACGME required implementation of the six core competencies as a framework for educational programs in GME. In 2003, duty hour standards became, were implemented as a common program requirement. Education transitioned from curriculum-centric to outcomes-based with needs of the health system driving competency outcomes and thus curriculum, rather than the other way around. Now, the outcomes are encapsulated in the uh, Institute for Health Improvement triple aim of better care for individuals, better health care for populations, and lower per capita cost. A quadruple aim was added which is improving physician well-being. Curriculum, as it should be, must be driven by the needs of society. Our curriculum has adapted uh, and now includes opioid management, addressing healthcare disparities and recognizing social determinants of health, LGBTQ needs, the needs of the aging population. We will also need to more earnestly address the need for more primary care physicians in our communities by making the learning more practical and attractive. Residents were evaluated on milestones progression and in measured competencies and given feedback so that they could advance from novice to expert by the time they graduate. The six core competencies are patient care, medical knowledge, professionalism, interpersonal and communication skills, practice-based learning and improvement, and systems-based practice. International medical graduates started entering the physician workforce during the 1950 expansion of the US healthcare system. Medical education became more globalized with students of diverse cultural backgrounds from diverse healthcare systems working together. ECFMG was put in place to ensure the clinical and communication skills requirement of foreign medical graduates that, and th that these uh, requirements were met. C 
currently, 25% of licensed US doctors are IMGs. The number had grown by 18% since 2010. Now, the majority of international medical graduates go into pathology, internal medicine, neurology, family medicine, and psychiatry, making up the shortfall of US grads that go into these fields. Another major impact on teaching and learning uh, has been generational differences between our teachers and learners. The aspiration, attitude to career, and communication preferences of millennials and Gen Zers are different. It is therefore imperative that we get to know our learners so that we can connect before we can start to mentor. Their style of learning has changed and this resulted in several major changes. We are seeing more integration of technology with simulation technology and virtual reality. There was a shift from traditional didactics to problem-based learning. There was also an emphasis on team-based work and interdisciplinary education. And the focus now is on how to improve patient-centered care and communication. This has in part contributed to some of the changes that we now see in undergraduate training with early incorporation of clinical medicine along with its basic sciences. Now, the majority of our students are no longer even millennials born in you know, 1980 to 1994, but the Gen Zers who are 1995 to two, uh, 2012 born. Some unique characteristics different from the millennials, millennials is uh, the Gen Zers want instant feedback. They want honesty and transparency. They want to be mentored and given feedback on an ongoing frequent basis. Um, I, I, I'm not saying this, but this is what I read. Their attention span is shorter, <laughs> as, is, as is their patience. Uh, you can tell us if this is true. Uh, but they are team players. Now, the other difference is salary and benefits and how they can advance are pivotal to Gen Zers. Now, another seismic uh, impact on medical education came out of the blue in 2020 with the unannounced arrival of the COVID pandemic. There was a sudden disruption to in-person learning and time-based curricula. And when learning went virtual due to the need for social distancing, bedside teaching took a beating. Schools and programs scrambled to put in place virtual learning which revealed inequity in the availability of technology. Trainees felt increasingly isolated. Recruitment interviews went virtual. The upside was lectures were remote and faculty from out of state were more generous with their time since they did not have to travel. Trainees became adept at telemedicine and residents got really comfortable with ICU level of care. Now, these dark days brought, brought out the best in many when they were really looking out for each other and supporting their peers. There were other major disruptions during the same time period, including racial trauma, medical student activism, and increased conversations surrounding race, racism, and gender identity. Trainees and faculty were more sensitive and vocal about these issues and that of inequity. Point of care ultrasound enhances education by reinforcing didactic concepts in clinical setting. Ultrasound simulations help students visualize anatomy, physiology, and pathology. The stethoscope is a learn listening device while POCUS gives medical providers eyes into the unknown. Seeing is believing, after all. The impact of the handheld ultrasound device on clinical medicine is likened to what Lennox did in transforming medicine with the stethoscope. Uh, the picture on the right are uh, Lennox-style stethoscopes, and they are on display at the Royal College of Medicine uh, in London. 
The advent of artificial intelligence looms in the foreground. It is positively impacting learning by providing a more personalized and adaptive learning platform. It will allow for an immersive experience for simulation and uh, simulation learning and virtual reality. AI in diagnostics and medical imaging is already in use. Data analysis and access of evidence-based medicine has become much faster. It will open up opportunities for remote learning and telemedicine training. And this will also open up resources for CME. There is, however, the fear that it will impact the teacher-patient, uh, no, teacher-student relationship. The role of a human teacher remains crucial despite advancements in technology and cannot be replaced for the following reasons. We can give guidance and mentorship, share clinical wisdom and reasoning. We improve clinical skills with bedside teaching. We can model emotional intelligence and empathy and our students learn critical thinking and ethical decision-making from us. We also provide immediate supervision and feedback, and only humans can be true role models. Now, Dr. Edward Hunter, the former Dean of Medical Education at Harvard, very eloquently stated that our role as medical educators is not the transfer of information but the transformation of learning. And for us to be able to effectively do that, we have to be in a transformative relationship with our learners because we cannot tell a stranger an important truth. The learners now learn the what at home and our role is to show them the how and why at the bedside. Medical information is advancing so quickly that half of what they learn will become irrelevant by the time they graduate. Dr. John Shaw Billings of Johns Hopkins said, the education of the doctor which goes on after he has his degree is after all the most important part of education. At the end of all of our efforts to train and mentor, we must remember that we are giving our students the tools to succeed to the teachers and mentors in the room, we are molding knowledge, skills, attitude, and habit. And that will take them into their future careers. In Native American culture, the medicine man does not choose to become a healer, but responds to a calling. It is important for all of us, including our learners, to remember that we are in the field of medicine with purpose and must find fulfillment in our work. So going back to the future again, what would I tell the younger me as I embarked on my journey in medicine 40 years ago? It will be the same advice to trainees as they launch into the world beyond. One, find your purpose. Each of us must know our purpose or calling. It is an existential question of why we are here. Some of us stay in the game because our patients need us. Others feel they want to make an impact on the next generation of physicians through education. Your purpose may be research and finding that next great truth that will change the way we care for our patients. Whatever it is, when you are drowning in your buckets, or your email inbox, you will need to hold on to your purpose. Two, find your joy. Again, you need to figure out what floats your boat. For me, it is the hug from my patients when I've made an emotional connection, or the joy of learning something new with my residents, and they know this in the clinic. Be self-compassionate and take time to enjoy matters outside of medicine, whether it is music, travel, hiking, volunteering, because you will come back refreshed. And three, find your tribe. The healthcare scene has changed and continues to change drastically post-COVID. 
you do not have to travel alone. As Mowgli from the Jungle Book would say, for the strength of the pack is the wolf, and the strength of the wolf is the pack. Get involved in societies like the Worcester District Medical Society, Mass Medical Society, and American College of Physicians, where we have a common voice, for there is much to stand up and speak out for during these times. We have to protect the future of our field. Now, I am very thankful for the amazing tribe that I work with every day. And it does take a village to raise a child. And in my program, we have 75 children. I am blessed to work closely with Drs. Trivedi, Hoig, Martin, and Sergeant, who would not be here, and Dr. Abraham, as well as my chief residents, Drs. Mera, Jacob, and Theo. The team is brilliant and selfless, and we have weathered many storms and achieved much to be proud about. A program can achieve much despite hurdles, but it is always a plus when you have a supportive GME, and that we do under the helm of Dr. Hadley. I am, of course, most fortunate to interact and learn daily from my residents and trainees, and I come to work every day for them. I will never be able to adequately express my gratitude to my children who have been so generous and graciously have you know, been sharing me with my patients and my residents. And they have kept me honest on how to handle the Gen Zers. <laughs> Where would I be without my husband, Dr. George Abraham, who has inspired and mentored me and has really been the wind beneath my wings? So, Thank you all, um, and I want to thank uh, Dr. Dale McGee and Martha Wright for really helping with all of the arrangements today. Thank you, it, it took a lot figuring all this out. And I want, you, you know, I want to thank all of you sp for spending time with us this evening, and uh, I look forward to any comments and questions. Thank you.